Everything you're hearing is from the Home Depot, from the baseboards and nails, to these throw pillows, even those super soft sheets. Because now at the Home Depot, you can get everything for your bedroom, from wooden nightstands to modern benches. Save up to 25% on select bedroom furniture, plus free and flexible delivery and easy in-store returns. Shop decor now at homedepot.com. More saving, more kinds of doing. Valid on select items online only. Free delivery on select items $45 or more. Visit homedepot.com for more information. Welcome, everyone, to Creating a Family, Talk About Infertility. And speaking of talking about, today we're going to be talking about how you talk with kids about donor conception. Um, As many of you know, that's a topic I have a a strong opinion on. I um, sound the drum beats or beat the drum beats. I guess sound the drum beats frequently uh, on this topic. Um, So uh, hence (laughs) hence why we cover it yet once again. Uh, Great guest. Uh, I wanted to read you something first. It is a uh, a comment that we received uh, about this uh, uh, podcast. It says, this is from uh, JLPT. Uh, She says, or I think it's a she, this podcast has so much great information on infertility. I wish I had listened months ago when I first started infertility treatment. Things probably would have gone better. However, I wish Dawn, the host, would work on decreasing her uhs and ums. Okay, JLPT, I am going to try to decrease my ums and ahs, or uhs, I guess it is, uhs and ums. Um, She raises a good point, Uh, and I'm going to try that. Uh, So I want you guys to join JLPT and uh, give us a comment. Uh, We'll take a star star rating if that's what you want to do, but we would really appreciate a comment. So please, it's important to us. It's how people find us, uh, and it means a lot to us, even when you're being critical. Um, it's good It's good feedback for me to hear that I need to work on my uhs and ums. And now I'm going to be kind of paranoid about it. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to do it. Uh, all right, this show is brought to you by, or underwritten by, our corporate sponsor, Faring Pharmaceutical. For men who are going through, they're often the forgotten uh, people in infertility, and there is an app called Fertistrong that is attempting to remedy that. It is a self-help fertility support mobile app specifically designed for men. It provides techniques to empower men with the knowledge and self-help skills throughout the journey of infertility. And, and let me add that it's, it's equally relevant whether it is male factor infertility or that he is just the partner of an infertile woman because in reality, you know, a couple is infertile if one of them is. So there's a lot of issues that are dealt with that are so seldom dealt with at other places. So please pop over to the web- website, Fertistrong dot com and grab this app. In addition to underwriters, we also have partners who believe in our mission of providing unbiased, medically accurate information. And we couldn't do what we do unless they did support us. Uh, one such partner is Shrass 2.0. They are a specialty fertility pharmacy that truly believes that pharmacy care can and should be remarkable. All of their employees, and that's, of course, the pharmacists, but all the way down to their shipping coordinators, understand the stress of fertility treatment and are trained to treat customers with dignity, empathy, and respect. And they really do believe in that. Uh, I met with uh, a lot of their team at uh, the ASRM, American Society of Reproductive Medicine Conference, in um, um, last October, and uh, I, I really was very, very impressed with their passion for trying to make this experience a less onerous one for the patients. So you can get more information about them at their website. All right, today we're going to be talking about talking with kids about donor conception. Parents dread this; they they do, and sadly. Um, I I think it is safe to say that the last research would indicate that, the latest research would indicate that uh, not only do parents dread it, they're not doing it. Uh, And they're not doing it because oftentimes they they don't know how. So today we're going to be giving some practical tips, uh, reasons why, and then uh, practical tips on how to do it. We'll be talking with Dr. Elaine Gordon. 
She is a clinical psychologist who specializes in infertility and child development. And she is the author of Mommy, Did I Grow in Your Tummy? Where Some Babies Come From. And that's a children, as you can imagine from the title. It is a children's book that explains a child's unique reproductive beginnings. And uh, it's both uh, addressed, of course, to children, but it also includes really good information for parents as well. This is a repeat of a show that we have, a re-air, I guess, of a show that uh, we did a couple of years ago. Uh, Dr. Gordon is so wise and so spot on with her advice that we're bringing it to you again. I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. Welcome, Dr. Gordon, to Creating a Family. I'm glad to be here. You know, I suppose that the premise of this show is based on the assumption that you should tell your children that they were conceived through third-party uh, reproduction. Um, but so maybe it would help if we begin the discussion on the if you should tell your child, since uh, since that would lay the, the groundwork. So, what is your opinion? Um, I, I am uh, will tell you that at least through our audience, and certainly through any of the surveys that I have seen, I think that the majority of people who conceived, especially through egg donation. Uh, are still not telling their children. And I, at the ASRM conference, I had a discussion with the uh, head of a, um, uh, an, a reproductive endocrinologist that led a um, uh, embryo donation facility uh, clinic, and he said that the majority of their patients with embryo donation are not telling their children either. So what do you think on that? Should people tell their children uh, if they were conceived through uh, donor egg, sperm, embryo, or surrogacy? Well, basically the research and thinking over the years that we believe that it's in the best interest of the child to know. Why is that? The reason that is is because secrets in families are very difficult not only to keep, but to live with, with that secret makes it difficult and it interferes with the relationship, the family dynamic itself. So we really believe the truth is the best way to go, but there are exceptions, of course. Well, like what would be the exceptions that would make it okay or, or pre- preferable um, to keep uh, conception history away from your children? Well, I think there are certain ethical, not ethical, I'm sorry, there are certain ethic and, um, what do I mean? <laughs> there are certain reasons to do that, and that has to do with cultures, people from other countries, um, what their belief system is. But basically, in the United States, we believe telling is the, you know, is the best way to go and the healthiest way to go. You know, it's, uh, what I, what it's just it's unimaginable to me that a child would not find out. And, and part of that's what I tell people, is that I believe your kids are going to find out. I think that if you've told one other person, that ups the odds, and almost everyone has told somebody else, and, you know, just with the whole medical testing and, and genetic testing, and I think that's going to be the wave of the future, I think that that opens up the, the possibility, or the probability, I should say, of children finding out. Um, plus, I think that, you know, your kids, uh, as soon as they start studying genetics, which begins usually in middle school now, they come home and they want to do the the tongue curling and the, you know, the, the earlobe, uh, whether it's connected and all the, you know, the easy tests. And kids are doing that immediately, and there are so many opportunities for kids to start asking questions. Um, so I, it seems to me that people, that your kids are going to find out. So the issue is, is do you tell them or do they find out otherwise? Well, the healthiest thing to do is to tell them. And, of course, you know, I think children will find out, because, you know, for those reasons you stated. Um, and then all, you know, it's, it becomes very, very difficult because there's a sense of betrayal. It's not that they don't love their parents anymore. It's just they don't understand why they were not told, and that makes it very difficult. So it becomes kind of like the, uh, what's the old thing with, uh, the old saying with uh, in politics, it's the cover-up, not the initial crime. or you know, not, it's, not the, it's not how they were conceived. It is the cover-up that then becomes the issue. Exactly, and then there's a trust issue, like you know, between the children and the parents. If you haven't told me this, what else haven't you told me? So again, in the best interest of the child, we think it's best for them to know um, about their reproductive beginnings and to have them know early on. Why do you think people dread 
telling because I think we, I mean, and I, I you know, I think adoptive parents also, um, especially in the past, I think that we're we're almost past that now. But it is, it feels awkward. Why is that? Well, I think there's the issue of shame, and I think that's one of the biggest issues because we do not come into this world like thinking we're going to adopt, use an egg donor, a sperm donor, or a surrogate. We think we're going to come into this world, grow up, get married, have children just like everybody else. And I think it sort of speaks to um, one's sense of womanhood, manhood, um, and family. Well, and also, is there is I hear exactly what you're saying, and that also worries me with the don't tell that that the the the, the people who are not telling that it in fact implies a sense of shame as to how their family was formed. But I also wonder if it's just kind of a squeamishness of talking about sex with our kids because conception implies, uh, in this case, the absence of intercourse. But still, it, it implies the whole notion that we have to get into our kid with our kids about how our babies formed. And is, do you sense that that's an, a, at play as well here? Well, you know, in some way it sort of moves away from sex. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> you know, and I think, you know, it's that piece might be even a relief because they don't <laughs> actually have to talk about sex. They could talk about an egg and a sperm and a Petri dish or, or whatever. But it's it's still the issue, you know, I believe shame is the biggest issue. And if we can get over the shame, then I think it would be so much easier. There is a sense of losing one's manhood, womanhood, when we have to reach out to other reproductive options. That's, yeah, I think that's that's true. Do you see? A, do you sense a difference between um, how women feel about having to use donor egg or how men feel about having to use donor sperm? Is there more a sense of manhood or womanhood tied up? into the gamete for a particular gender? I think, you know, historically there certainly has been a bigger issue around sperm donation, for example, than um, egg donation. And that's because the medical communities very early on have colluded with the patients in terms of don't tell, um, nobody needs to know, this is your child. Um, And so they've um, made it the you know recipients shameful about this process. The implication of a secret is you're doing something that's not quite okay. Mm-hmm. And and um, as I'm sure you well know, that is still the approach of many uh, of many uh, clinics um, that don't that don't tell is still being encouraged. Um, um, but I think I, I I was a bit surprised by that because I thought that there would be more. But for the most part, the clinics. Are not and are not encouraging telling. They're not encouraging telling, and they are not. <clears throat> again, it's it's stepping into an area that they really know very little about. It was it would be like me going in and doing an egg aspiration. <laughs> yeah. And yet, yes, I hear exactly what you're saying. And yet, people do turn to the reproductive endocrinologist or to their donor agency. Um, for uh, for advice. Uh, so, yeah, whereas and, nobody's going to be coming to you for an egg aspiration. Right. And the, and the agencies themselves, it is a lot more work because if you are encouraging telling, then you're getting into the, um, into the issue of do they do an anonymous egg or sperm donation. And that's a whole other like, like issue that ha- would have to be dealt with. Yeah, and providing contact and ongoing. Yeah, you're exactly right. Although a lot of them, or some of them anyway, charge differently for that to to make up the difference. So, is there one best age to start telling children about their conception? What I tell my patients, and when I speak about this issue, I really encourage them to incorporate books very early in their child's life, three years old. A, you know, about about all kinds of families, not just the particular one that relates to their family. To talk about, you know, read books about um, single-parent families, adoption, egg donation, sperm donation, ducks that live with chickens, you know, elephants that live with um, giraffes. So what you're doing is you're building a base that there is not one kind of family. And it's not that the child is at that juncture is going to understand egg, sperm, surrogacy, you know, all of that. But you're just really explaining that there's not one definition of family. 
So by the time they understand egg sperm, which is around seven, eight years old, it won't be odd, it won't be unusual, it will be, oh, that's just like the book we read, um, Janie Got an Egg. So what you're trying to do is normalize it. And and so I hear exactly what you're saying, and I love that that you're that you're you're uh, casting a net that says families are good, all families are good, families are formed in different ways, Absolutely. and there's no one better way; they're just different ways. Yes, and I think it just sets the groundwork. So whatever the child encounters, because I think parents are afraid of what of the discrimination they're going to encounter if people know. Well, yeah, I think that that. It, 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 I think there is the fear that uh, one reason not to tell other family members is because you're afraid that their children will be treated differently. And I think you're exactly right that somehow it shows that your child is lesser in some way, so it's a protective instinct, you know, and, and from yeah. uh, from a parent. So and around the, age, the I'm sorry, go on. I was going to say around the age of seven or eight, children begin to understand the concept of egg and sperm. So is that when you start? Uh, specifically introducing the concept that there was someone else involved? That would be an appropriate time to do so. But you also have to understand children are all different. There are some children that are going to be much more curious about that, and there are other children that are not going to care. There are children that want to know why the sky is blue, and there are other children that want to know um, that they don't care, you know, why is it green or purple. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it, 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 true, but if your child is one of those, because I have four kids and I have some who are quite curious and I have some who are not, but I've always felt that I still have an obligation, even for my kids who are not asking questions, uh, to provide them information. Um, and it's always it, it would always be easier not to because they're not asking. So it could be my justification to say, oh, well, I don't really need to tell because if they're curious, they're going to ask. You could take that. But that seems to be a bit of a cop-out, or is that just me? Well, I don't think it's a cop-out. I think you do give them the information, but you don't push it. I mean, you give them the information so they have it, open the door for any questions they may have, and children may come back at another time and ask more questions. But you don't want to ever have them not know that you never told them. The goal is if I was to meet a child and they were born through um, adoption or sperm donation or something like that when they were an adult. And I asked them the question, when did your parents first tell you you were a product of um, egg donation, for example? I would really like them to be in a position where they scratch their heads, look a little puzzled, and say to me, hmm, I don't remember. I've always known. Uh Uh-huh. That's the perfect, and that that would seem so. The idea is to start incorporating it early enough that your children always grow up with the knowledge. Absolutely, yeah. and that's probably the healthiest. And I think it also relieves the parents of the burden of the secret, which is really a heavy load to carry. Well, yes, because it requires a continual lie, and I think that's what people downplay. But there are, especially as your children get uh, a little older, there are so many opportunities that come up in daily life that will require you to smudge the truth uh, if you have not told. And, and and I think there that goes back to what you were saying earlier. Then it becomes when your children find out, if they find out, it becomes the, the lies, the secret and the lies, not the, the information. The issue becomes that. Yeah. Absolutely. And you know, it's and it's subtle. It doesn't have to be obvious. For example, you can be in a grocery store and um you're holding on to your child's hand because of course you don't want to lose them. <laughs> and the clerk at the checkout stand says, "Where did he get those big brown eyes?" And mm-hmm. what happens is your hand just subtly tightens every time someone mentions your child's eyes. Mhm. And so the child walks away saying, hmm, there must be something wrong with my eyes because my eyes are funny. Or you're in the doctor's office and they ask for a family history. And you have to mentally make the decision. 
am I going to tell the truth or am I going to lie? Because if you provide your own family history as a mother and it's, the child is conceived through donor egg or, or if you provide your family's fam, uh, medical history and your child is conceived through donor embryo or whatever, then then you're making you're having to make that choice right then. And some people say, well, I will tell the doctor the truth, but then you have to contrive a way to get your child out of the room. And, and when your children are younger, you think, oh, that's no big deal. But as your children get older, they're in the room a lot more, and they're, over, and they're overhearing a lot more. Again, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Here's a question from Laura. She said, I know it's best to tell children when they're young about being from donor egg so that it feels as if they always knew when they get older. And I might add that Laura is a long-term listener here, and so she has picked up. (laughs) So good for you, Laura, good for you. Here's an issue that my husband brought up. We haven't told family or friends about our girls being donor-conceived because we made the decision before they were born that that we would tell them first. We wanted to do this because we thought it would give them a chance to tell their story to others if they chose to do so. Now that that decision seems a bit tricky. I have already, quote, told them, though they are only one years old, and I know they can't fully understand yet. If we keep telling them about uh, if we keep talking with them about it, I figure they will probably tell without even realizing what they are doing. So then it's not really their choice such as when they are three or four and say something to a family member about a nice lady giving mama a cell, etc. That's not a conscious decision to tell about their beginnings. It's just a child talking. So what's the best way to handle this? I don't want them to... I don't want to tell them it's a secret and make it seem bad. My husband seems to think that we could talk about egg donation in general and not tell them that this is how they came about until a little later. But that seems even more confusing to me. Well, you know, the issue of telling, there's also something called overtelling. And you don't want to make it the focus of your child's life. So you have to find the right balance between the telling and not overtelling. And reading books, a child one-year-old, um, maybe that's a little too early, and maybe the telling at that age is really for the parent so mm-hmm. they can get comfortable with the language and the words. But and I think the idea that's a good idea. I, I think practicing on a one-year-old is, is a great idea. Because they wouldn't have any idea what you're talking about. Either. Exactly. <laughs> but I get more comfortable with the use of the words, and I kind of get my get my story down, you know. <laughs> Go ahead. Exactly. And then starting around two and a half, three, whenever, you start to incorporate, incorporate those books. And a sideline, you can always say, you know, we're so happy we um, – that there was this nice lady that, you know, like using Laura's words, um, like gave us a cell or an egg or whatever it was, without sort of taking it any further at that juncture. Because developmentally, they're certainly not ready to understand that nor incorporate it. So what you're doing is just setting the stage. Which is, and you had mentioned earlier, and at the same time you're also setting the stage that there are lots of different ways for families to form. No, absolutely, but you do, and I don't want to call it a risk because I don't see it as a risk, but you do run the um, possibility of the child goes to preschool and says, Mommy got an egg from, you know, so-and-so. Well, and and let me read another question we got. Apparently this is, uh, uh, Laura's not the only one who has has, uh, faced this. This is from Luann. She says, My three kids were all conceived through donor sperm. We have told them from the beginning, but I don't want them to go blabbing this to other kids on the playground since it feels private. I also don't want to make this a secret either. We are trying to decide what to tell our eldest, who is now in first grade. So now she's got a child who is around seven, uh, um, six or seven, probably about seven now, um, in first grade. So how do you you know, keep that that boundary between this is a little more private than and I'm trying to think I mean, a child who is conceived without third party reproduction children don't generally talk about their conception you know mom and dad went to new york for the weekend and by golly you know i showed up 9 months later kids don't normally talk about that so is is it a a big concern that children will talk about uh that you know and the nice person who gave or the nice in this case the nice man who gave um his sperm so that uh mommy and daddy could have a baby well, I don't think that's the first thing they're going to bring up, but if they're sitting in sharing circle and they forgot their rock or their doll or their whatever to share and they just heard about the book, you know, that their parent just read them the book, um, 
daddy and mommy got a sperm, they may bring it up. <laughs> and I think when people say I don't, it's private, I wonder what sits behind that concept. And my guess is there has to be some shame behind that. Because the difference, you know, it's hard. If If there's no shame, why does it need to be kept private? And I can understand the concept, but we have to really think about what is in the best interest of the child. And they come first. When you decide to parent, your children do take precedent over your own needs and you know and feelings at times. So it's a hard, you know, I really appreciate that it's a very hard decision. But but but, but my but I would think that it probably it's even if if there's not shame associated, I can understand not wanting your child to talk about something like uh donor sperm in first grade that that it would both make probably the teacher uncomfortable and that the other kids might tease or something along those lines. Do you see that happening, or is this really more of an adult uh, thought process and a kid would just handle it? Matter of fact, oh, yeah, mom and dad got a sperm, period, no big deal, and the kids would just handle it that way, or does it become a bigger issue that might involve the child? Well, I don't think it's going to become a bigger issue in kindergarten, like first grade. It might become an issue as they get a little bit older, but hopefully by that time the parents have worked with the children on you know, how to handle anything that comes up. You know, in the old days, it was wearing glasses. Um, again, adoption used to be a shameful thing, and we look at adoption very differently now. Children are not ashamed, and the parents are not ashamed to say we've adopted. I think in time, sperm and egg donation will, you know, walk that same line, but not quite yet. We're really in a transition um, in terms of how comfortable we are with these new reproductive, you know, technologies. And you do run the risk of a child, um, you know, um, sharing the sharing the quote secret. And and am I hearing you correctly that the way to handle that is to work on your own concept of whether or not it is a secret? Exactly, exactly. And you know, again, I am not disrespecting the fact that it feels private, but you can't talk about just yourself. A child, if they're comfortable with their family, and they are cared for and loved, they're going to be fine. They really are going to be fine. The research sort of speaks to that, that these children are not ostracized. Um, They know how to take care of themselves. It's the secret keeping that has turned out to be the issue or the problem. I want to come back to the research. Let me, before I I want to read this one uh, last question that's kind of on the same topic, uh, and this one, uh, she asked that her name not be used. We haven't told anyone except three people about using donor egg. I think it might affect how others treat our son. I've been listening to some of your old shows on this topic and beginning to realize that maybe we should tell our son. We also had a health scare with him, and the doctors were asking about family history. At first, I just said we didn't think there was a family history of this particular thing, but then we decided that that wasn't completely honest and might have an impact on his care. So we went back to the doctor and told him that we had very little maternal family history. The doctor said that it would make a difference in the type of test they ran, so I'm glad we did. Now we think we need to tell him because had he been older, he would have heard all these discussions. Can we tell him but still tell no one else? It is no one else's business. We are thinking about waiting until he is much older so that he can understand that he should only share this information on a need-to-know basis. So I guess uh, she, she asked two questions. I'm going to break them down. One, can you tell your child but but tell no one, and, and even if no one else has been told? Uh, she doesn't give the age of her child, but I am getting the feeling he's not particularly old because she referred to the fact that that, uh, that he, he was not aware of the discussions that were taking place with the doctor. Well, you're basically in a bind there because you're telling him and then you're also telling him that it's a secret or it's private. So it's a tough place to be. I I do believe that doctors absolutely need to have that information. So she did she did right. Um <clears throat> I think it's very important that all doctors have med- correct medical information or as much medical as information as you know. Yeah. But the idea of sort of telling a child and asking them to keep it a secret. Children are not good at keeping secrets. They're just not. And well, then her point would be then why not wait till he's much older 
so that they can say they could tell him and uh, also ask him to not share. That was her well, suggestion of how to solve the problem. Yeah, I would like to know what she means by much older. Pre-adolescence is not the best time to tell a child about their reproductive beginnings. If she's talking about eight or nine years old, maybe that's okay, but I would still build the ground in terms of there are all kinds of families, getting him comfortable with the concept of different genetic material, um, like living in their household, so to speak. Mm Mm-hmm. So she can handle it that way. And it also, you know, it is, a, you know, a regional issue as well. You know, I'm in California, and it's a more liberal here, you know, as is um, the the East Coast. If she lives somewhere else, it's probably, a, a, you know, like a tougher issue, and I do appreciate that. It's, I that think will, that's a very accurate point. I think that... Uh, and I think that, and I appreciate that you um, that you acknowledge it because I do believe that where you live makes a difference as to how how much people either know or how much they talk about um, uh, third party reproduction. Mhm. Mhm. You talked about some of the research. I am a research geek. What is uh, uh, what is some of the research showing on how children conceive through? Uh, donor sperm, egg, or embryo, or surrogacy, uh, how they're doing, uh, and, and does this, uh, the fact that they were conceived uh, with someone else's genetic material make a difference on how they relate to their families and, and how they develop? Emotion? Well, I think generally the research to date shows that these children are absolutely fine. They are basically no different than any other children. The only issue that seems to have emerged is that children who are not told or find out later, inadvertently find out, have strong feelings about that piece. And I and, and I think I mentioned before that it's not the information, it's the not telling. That they and, feel, and they've been able to do some some tests. I mean, not tests. Listen to me. Um, some research where they found subjects where children who were conceived through uh, probably I'm going to guess donor sperm because uh, it's been going on for longer have been older, and and uh, they've been able to uh, find out how those kids are doing and compare them to kids who were conceived through donor sperm who were told from the beginning. Is that is that how the research is playing out? Okay, you know, again, I'm not a research geek, but Susan Gollenbach from London has done a lot of work in this arena, mm-hmm. and, yeah. you know, she has done some long-term um, work that really sort of speaks to that these children are basically just fine. And she's yeah, compared have... different groups, she's followed them over time, um, and she's really done, I think, the body of research in this, you know, um, area. I think she has as well. She and I have been in communication uh, over the years about getting uh, having her on the show. There's always a problem because of the time difference. Uh, so it hasn't worked up to date, but I'm fascinated by her research. You are listening to Creating a Family. Today we're talking about when and how to talk with your children about third-party conception. Our guest today is Dr. D. Elaine Gordon. She is a clinical psychologist with a specialty in infertility and child development. She is also the author of Mommy, Did I Grow in Your Tummy? Where Many Babies Come From. And that's a children's book explaining a child's unique reproductive beginnings. Now, what would be helpful, I think, is to, well, first of all, let me ask this question. Is there a significant difference in the way you would tell the story, depending on what type of third-party reproduction you use, whether it be donor uh, sperm, donor egg, embryo donation, or surrogacy? Well, I think there are some differences, and of course there are some similarities. And what I you know, encourage people to do is you really talk about the issue that mommy and daddy or mommies or, you know, or I wanted to have a baby very much. You know, we really wanted one, and we tried and we tried, whatever that means, depending on the age of the child, of course. And we went to a doctor to try to help us. And, you know, if it's, you know, sperm donation, we say, or egg donation, we would say, like, mommy's eggs weren't working, you know, and so 
this nice person, and you can name them or not name them, gave Mommy and Daddy an egg so we could have you. So you really talk about what the intention is from the get-go. The intention is for this person who is helpful, gifted, basically gifted or gave us an egg or a sperm, whatever, so we could have you. So the message is very clear that nobody was forced, there was no coercion, this was done with intent. Now, with adoption, of course, it's a little bit different. Yeah, I think that I, I think it can be. What about the idea that when you say, you know, a nice lady gave, and speaking in terms at this point of egg donation, a nice lady gave mommy and daddy an egg so we could have you, that you are glossing over the fact that, in fact, you paid for this egg. And you actually don't know the intent of the person. Uh, you might know the intent, but assuming it's um, the more traditional way where you actually don't meet and have long-term conversations with the egg donor, so you don't really know their intent. Is there anything wrong with um, um, just painting it in the best light and not um, – there are some people who say that, that's, that that would be inaccurate to say. Well, it's it's not an accurate. It's really the opener. It's how you open it. How far you want to take it is up to you, of course. But the opening is every sperm donor, every egg donor. Their in, their intention is to help someone else have a baby. That's why they're doing it. Yes, they get compensated for it, but their intention, you know, is the same. So it's not a non-truth. It just, it, it's it's a beginning. I see what you're saying. It's an opener. Well, and that would uh, um, one of the things that I uh, somebody had said sp- that they hoped that we would specifically do in this show is have show a model conversation uh, depending on the age of the child. And you've just uh, and, and I'm going to summarize what I think you've said up to this point. Um, th- to begin with, you would be laying the groundwork. Uh, through books, uh, uh, picture books and other books, with a very young child, a toddler, on up, preschooler, on families are formed by a lot of different ways and all and, and all ways are okay. So that's kind of the, the, the very beginning. Right. And then you talked about the uh, mommy and daddy wanted a baby very much and uh, it wasn't happening, so we, uh, we had to go to a doctor to get help and, you know, you know Daddy's sperm weren't working or mommy's egg wasn't working and that a nice person gave mommy and daddy an egg or a sperm or whatever or an embryo. Um, So that would be a conversation just roughly, depending on the uh, the maturity of the child, would that be a conversation for a four-, five-, six-year-old? Yes, absolutely, even though they may not quite understand what an egg and a sperm, but if you've been reading those books, it would sort of, fit it would sort of make sense even though specifically they don't understand that you take an egg and a sperm and you fertilize it and you know and it creates a baby but what you're doing is just laying groundwork you know at this point okay so then and then i would assume that the next steps would be to start filling in a little more detail uh, as the child ages so give us an idea of some different ages and and some additional information that can be filled in uh, as as you go. Okay, the the additional information is depending on the child's you know questions. It could be who you know who is she, um, what does she look like, um, where did you get the sperm, um, will I meet them, um, have you met them, do you know them. And again, this gets to my point. I, you know, I, I do have to say my bias, or is that I do believe in open donation. I do anonymous donation in terms of my work because a lot of people still are doing it. But I do more, and, you know, I'm doing more and more open donation counseling, where the recipients actually meet their donors. So that's a whole new track that is sort of um, people are going down. Yeah, I think, and uh, unfortunately, or, or uh, that was not an option for many people whose children are now uh, elementary age. Uh, yeah. It is becoming a uh, it's becoming an option that's uh, available. 
And I think you can tell a child that, you know, have you met her? No, they, you know, the way the doctor's office worked, we, you know, they didn't do it that way. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to and I couldn't or they recommended not to. Maybe it was a mis you know. So, again, you can tell the truth at that point. I mean, it, you didn't do anything wrong. Um, it wasn't an option or you didn't think it was or or you were, um, it was recommended to you, like, not to meet her. But everybody should have some inf- pretty much some information about that child, about that donor, and share and as much as you have because that's. I was just going to say, and would you share uh, as much information as you have? What about the uh, possibility of just usually you have a print uh, you have printed information that you've received? Uh, what about the possibility of just sharing the printed information? Oh, absolutely. But I would, you know, by the time a child's a pre-adolescent, they probably should have the whole story. So your goal would be for them to have as much information as you have by 11 or 12? If they're interested, yes. And and the offer of the information. We also have to respect who our children are. And some some children just don't want to know. They know it's there, they know it's available, but they're just don't want to look at that for whatever for lots of different reasons. And that is, is a perfect segue into a question we have from Bert. He says our 11 our 11 year old daughter has never asked for any information and seems to have no interest. I feel like she deserves and should have some of this information. How should we handle this? Now, do, you know, the question is does she know? First of all, because if she doesn't know that she there's something to ask. She's not going to ask. In that Assuming case, in this case that she does, that's a good point. Uh, but does she even know? So, so yeah. you can't expect but, them to ask if they were conceived through donor sperm, for instance, if they have no concept that that's something that they might even be a possibility, right? Exactly. And um, but if she does know, you just make the offer. If you ever have any questions, you know, feel free to ask. Mommy and you know, and, and Dad will you know, like tell you anything that we know or you'd like to know. I think you just open the door there and periodically open that door. Yeah, and I I always some say children just don't want to go there. They're just, you know, their their lives, you know, they're busy, they've got things to do and this is the last the last thing they want to address at this juncture. What about having some of this information in a place where the child knows where it is that they can, let's say you have a printout with some information about the sperm donor. Um, either including it in uh, their baby book or in a place that they have access to it so that if they want to look at it in private and kind of process it on their own without having a conversation with you, it's it's an option, especially if you've already, if you continue to throw the option out there that you're available to talk. Well, you know, I would suggest that the parents keep hold of the information and and just have the child ask for the information and, and just give it to them. Let them go into the room, let them process it, let them look at it. If they want to keep it, that's another story. You can respect that, but please keep a copy. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> very good very good point. Here's a question from Laura. She says, do you think that embryo adoption should be addressed to others and your ch- and your children as an infertility treatment or as an adoption? That... Laura's opening a big can of worms. The the industry right now, the reproductive industry, we do not, we have not figured out how to do embryo adoption or em, embryo donation, whichever words you want to use, um, in any consistent way. Every office is doing it differently. This is something that the mental health professional group at ASRM is looking at. We're addressing it. We're talking about it. But it is different people have different thoughts about adoption because it really, whether it's adoption or donation, and that sort of includes religious beliefs, cultural beliefs, um, medical beliefs. Um, so it's, you know, when does life start? So that is a, a whole can of worms that we're just beginning to look at and address. And different agencies that do embryo donation have different perspectives on how that should be handled. Well, I think a lot of the controversy you're speaking of has to do with whether or not 
you, you treat an embryo as a person, and then it gets into a lot of political and a lot of far-ranging issues. But exactly. let's just bring it back to just from a parent standpoint, um, and because your kids don't care about personhood, that that really isn't something that they care about. Um, is it? Does it matter from a parent? Uh, when you're talking with others, or and especially when you're talking with children, and if you either view it or speak of it as an infertility treatment or as an adoption, I think that's very, very personal, and it has to do with your religious beliefs and um, your beliefs on whether this is, is the embryo a person at that point or not. So. Again, it's a very difficult question for me to answer at this point because I would be talking about my own bias, but I don't think that's fair at this juncture. And the truth is, as far as I know, there is almost no research available. We could postulate that that, that and try to use other research to apply, but in fact, there really isn't any research out there that I know of on children conceived through embryo donation, um, and and as to, and I'm not sure if if it if, if research is going to show what's best. You know, I don't know that that's. I, no, I, don't I agree know with you. Yeah, I yeah. absolutely agree with you. Um, and I, the the embryo donation world is just really not set up at this at this point, as I as I mentioned before. What do you mean by that? It's not. So, you mean that it's well, so, there's, so. You know, we know pretty much um, egg donation is done in a fairly consistent like fashion. Sperm donation is usually done in a fairly consistent fashion, as is surrogacy, as is adoption. Embryo donation is not. It's something that's just you know come up more recently. Although it's probably been done privately in offices, medical offices that we don't even know about. There's real differences in how much information the recipient get on the embryo or the genetic providers of that embryo um, in terms of who has the power to make those matches, those donations. Um, it's it's just not, not settled in any fashion. And that's, and that's unfortunate, but we are talking about it. That's interesting. I guess I probably wasn't aware that it was being handled in such in such diversity, um, and I can see that that would uh, certainly complicate uh, because you could certainly do it through a. We're getting ready to have a show in the next quarter on some of the practical issues, uh, the nuts and bolts of embryo donation, because we have received a number of questions asking some real, uh, just practical, uh, you know, hands-on type of things about about it. So we'll probably get into more of it then. We have a question from Teresa, and she says that they it's, – it's fairly long. I'm going to summarize it. They uh, Their daughter was conceived through anonymous uh, egg donation uh, and is beginning to ask for uh, more information, uh, although she's still quite young. You know, she's eight. Uh, and they're wanting to know how to handle her specific questions. Well, I think they have to, you know, if they are sharing with her, is that they tell her the truth, that they were not given the opportunity for more information and to give her any information that they do have access to. And, and from because your experience... nothing else they can do. <laughs> yeah, well, that's true. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, well, no, they could try to get additional information, although I would be very surprised if they were successful. Have you heard of people being able to get additional information if they wanted it? In some cases, but right now um, it's very, very difficult. Um, I, I do know someone, and I'm not saying anybody should do this, but she hired a private detective and got information, which I thought was very interesting. Uh, and what would propel her to do that? Were there medical reasons, or was it to answer her child's questions? To answer her child's questions, she just wanted more information. And she didn't interfere. She didn't um, intrude on that person's life in any way. But she just wanted more information. And I'm not condoning that or, you know, that's just um, something I, I just happen to know about. Yeah, that she, that, that it's, 
and, and quite frankly, it may not be an option. Um, it's something to think about as well. And it certainly probably wouldn't be an inexpensive option either. Um, we haven't really talked much about uh, surrogacy. In, in what ways is surrogacy different? Unless, and, and with surrogacy, we have to break it down into talking about uh, a gestational carrier. And uh, just for our audience sake, let me uh, make the distinction between a traditional surrogate and a gest- gestational carrier. A gestational carrier has no genetic connection to the child. Uh, it is a um, either the egg and the sperm from the intended parents or a donated egg and or sperm uh, that create the embryo, and that embryo is then transferred uh, into a woman who uh, is going to carry the child for the nine months uh, versus a traditional surrogate. And although uh, it is traditional surrogacy is happening less, it still is does happen, and it's still legal in uh, many states, and that is where the egg belongs to the uh, surrogate and uh, it is the sperm of the intended parent usually, I guess it could be a donor sperm, uh, that is transferred. In fact, it's usually done through artificial insemination, not IVF. Mm -hmm. So um, how does that, uh, let's talk surrogacy uh, here since we haven't done. Uh, Let's start with gestational surrogacy and talk about that and then talk about uh, how it might change the story and uh, if uh, it's a traditional surrogate. Well, basically, it's it's almost it's a similar story in terms of that you know we wanted a a baby, and we tried and tried, and you know mommy's uterus wasn't working. Um, you know, using any words to explain that, um, and then saying we met this really, we went to the doctor or we went to an agency, we met this really lovely woman named Jane, and she said that she would be happy to grow a baby our baby in her uterus and um and help us. So it's you know, it's just an open, honest story and most I would say almost all surrogate arrangements are open. They do know each other. There is some kind of a relationship, especially in the healthy arrangements. And usually you have pictures, uh of and if you don't, if you are um I, I strongly encourage you to get pictures of uh the surrogate uh, and you might pictures. even meet the surrogate. There's, you yes. probably have more than pictures, you know, yes, exactly. if, the, if the relationship, you know, goes on. And in many cases, you know, these surrogate arrangements I've been involved with, they still stay in contact over year, or you know, over the years. Right, it, exactly. And so that the, the person can, um, your child could have contact with that person uh, if you so want and if the surrogate so wants. You know, in, in fact, right now I'm working with three surrogate mothers whose mothers were surrogates which i think what i i find fascinating that is fascinating it's interesting to think in terms that we are now at the point where that the surrogate's children are old enough to be a surrogate mhm yeah i hadn't even thought about that but i suppose yeah yes and that could happen particularly with traditional surrogates versus uh, gestational carriers well in most cases in all in all all the cases that I've been involved in, except one, the um, the daughter is a gestational surrogate, where the mother was a traditional surrogate. Right, just because that's the way our uh, the, the the medical science has kind of developed exactly. And I've had this these surrogates say, "Well, I remember I was eight years old and I met this nice couple, and it was just really a positive experience. They were this, they were that. Um, so it's you know it's quite interesting." <laughs> Yeah, that is actually, and I, I suppose in this case at least, it was a po- that it was handled in, within the context of their family in a positive way, right? Uh, so that they, you know, introduced it was not a. Uh, we just received this uh, uh, email, and she was rather uh, cryptic, but she says, "I want to know how to handle the issue of cost as my children get older." You talked about wanting that that they that you wanted by the time the child was 11 or 12 to have all the information. How do I introduce the concept of cost or payment? I assume is what she's talking about. Well, you know, I, you know, everything costs. You know, almost everything costs. So I, I don't think you have to make. You know, you know, you, there are people that work at the agency and and they're paid and you know. And the surrogate mother is compensated because she's putting out time and effort and energy. 
um, I think you just talk about it as, you know, in, in reality, the truth, not, you know, the surrogate, healthy surrogates are not doing it only for the money. And I think that's just a misconception. And I work with surrogates who feel indignant when they're accused of that or they're asked about how much they're getting. It's nice for them to be compensated, and they usually use that money to do something for their family because their family is usually put out a little bit when they're too tired to make dinner, when they're, you know, the backs are hurting and they need to lay down. So they're not necessarily doing it for the money. In the healthy they're, arrangements, they're, yeah. they're doing it. It is a factor, but not necessarily the, the primary factor. Yes, they're doing it um, because it's such a power, empowering experience to be able to help someone have a family. Because all surrogates should have had their own children and should be mothers. And anybody who does it any differently, I think you're asking for trouble. I think that is, uh, I, I hear certainly, um, that is certainly more, that's what, certainly what I'm hearing is, uh, I don't know if, if I could say that everyone is doing it that way, but I'm certainly hearing that that is by far the majority. You have talked about the importance of books, and you know, as somebody who loves children's literature and loves to read to my kids, um, you know, you're, you're, you're playing my song. Um, it is often easier to find books for children when they are younger, at the picture book age, versus books that are more appropriate for, say, a six- or seven-year-old or books that in, include this idea of families being formed in many different ways, and especially third-party reproduction for children who are upper elementary. Do you know of any books uh, for, uh, let's break that, uh, um, let's break it down. Uh, your book certainly is, uh, what age, first of all, is, is your book? Uh, well, well, my book basically, um, you know, is one of the first that was written. The um, first edition came out in 1992, and it's just recently been updated. Um, my book speaks to all of the reproductive options in terms of a couple wanting the baby, they went to the doctor, and these are the options that the that doctor was offering them. It goes through and explains the options, and then they end up with a baby, but it doesn't say which option they used. So that's something, that book can be read in pieces. It doesn't have to be read in whole because it's way too much for a three-year-old, but it's, a, it's not too much for an eight-year-old or a seven-year-old. But mm -hmm. there are a lot of other books out there. Mine is certainly not the only one. And if you go, I have a bibliography on, on, on my website, and the ASRM, the American Society for Reproductive Medicine, has a bibliography as well. And we um, have an extensive bibliography. And you and, have one. So there are yeah. a lot of books that speak to those, um, you know, reproductive options. There's and and let, me put in, let me put in a plug right now that okay. we divide our books, both books for children, and we give a suggested age rate. And we also have books for adults on talking with your kids because I think that sometimes that's helpful as well. So um, it, it's helpful to have both. Um, but as far as books for, uh, are, are there? Can you think of? And this may be unfair since I'm, I'm catching you uh, without having warned you. I was going to ask this question, but books for children who are, say, older. Let's let's say you're eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve year old. There are very few, but there are some on it. I'm just, you know, I'm I'm not catching the remembering the names, but there are relative to adoption. I know. It's, yeah, but yeah. I. I but yeah, there are I can't. not any, as of yet, on egg donation, sperm donation, and um, surrogacy. And but I know there's one. I'm just trying to. I'm just not remembering the name of it. One there's one book that I have recommended before. Uh, how babies and families are made, made. There's more than one way. It's kind of a basic sex ed type book, but for families formed in different, in alternative ways. Um, uh, there's a book called The Kangaroo Pouch. Uh, right. I think it would bore a 10-year-old, but uh, the, the suggested age is up to 10. Yeah, that's pushing it, I think, for that one. <laughs> I do, too. I think that, that <laughs> your 10-year-old's your going to be going, yeah, boring, Mom. Um, so most, unfortunately, most, you know, and what I think this is a, a call for those authors who are listening, I, I think that it's particularly powerful with uh, older kids if it's not a book so much, it's 
it could be a fiction book, but that part of the theme is that one of the uh, characters was uh, conceived through donor sperm. It doesn't even have to be the primary emphasis of the book at all. It can just be, uh, you know, something that we're talking about. It's part of the book, and I think those books, I think that's been one of the powerful things in the adoption literature is that there's a, a host of great books for children who were adopted where it's not necessarily all about the adoption, but adoption is just treated as part of everyday part of life for these characters, as the, in, which are you know, young teens or um, tweens. And on, on television as well, there are a lot of programs at this point that incorporate surrogacy, donation, um, adoption, um, as you know, as you said, in you know, in their characters. Unfortunately, yeah, the hard part is that not all, not that many of those shows are really appropriate for uh, you know uh, tweens, and 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 some of them are just not appropriate to watch as a family because it makes us all uncomfortable because that's not the only topic they're talking about. Well, you know, ten years ago we had very we had almost no books about even for young children. So I would imagine we'll have the pre-adolescent books coming out, you know, in the next few mm-hmm. years. Yeah, I think you're probably exactly right. Well, we have reached at the end of our hour. Thank you so much, Dr. Elaine Gordon, for being our guest today on Creating a Family. I know some of you will want some more some of you will want some more information about Dr. Gordon as well as about her book, and you can get that information at her website, Elaine Gordon dot com and that is g o r d o n uh dot com you can of course get her book on amazon but you can go to her website and access both the bibliography of other books as well as get additional information so i would recommend that you do that thanks for joining us today and i will see you next week come to the home depot this month and you'll learn a thing or two actually three with three free do-it-yourself workshops Learn how to design and care for your container garden by selecting the best soil and aesthetically arranging your plants. Learn how to install tile flooring, even how to keep your outdoor deck and patio space in the best shape possible. See, it's never too late to learn something new. Register today at homedepot.com slash workshops for a do-it-yourself workshop near you. Only at the Home Depot. More saving, more doing.